Hello, every folks, and welcome to a beginner's guide to Night of Lotus. So, this is one of my favorite games growing up. I've spent ungodly hours in this thing uh, when I was a little kid, uh, you know, burning midnight midnight oil on a GBA SP until who knows when. And oh man, it was worth it. So. First of all, let me just say, before we even get into the Beginner's Guide itself, with Reborn on the way, I constantly feel, looking at those new uh, screenshots and everything else, that they're taking some visual cues from this thing, because I can't help but notice that uh, from the new, you know, tones all over the UI to the general vibrancy of everything, I feel like somebody else must have been a KOL fan there. Just like, every time that I look at this UI, it just makes me happy. Every time I boot up this game, it's just like... Every little detail in it is an absolute joy, and not even for nostalgia's sake, but just the amount of care that went into a GBA spin-off game of a series so niche that nobody on this side of the world had really heard about it much at this point. Um, anyway, so let's go ahead and get started. What do you actually need to know to get into this game? Well, first of all, not very much, actually. Um, basically, this is by far the most uh, self-explanatory game of the entire series. It's the one that I always recommend when people want to get into this series, because A, it's not super long, B, it's not super complicated, uh, C, uh, pretty much all of the crazy endgame content is, well, I mean, it's a GBA game, so they boiled it down to a more or less uh, side quest mode uh, They just sort of go into and you do little challenge fights and you get items and um, yeah, it, like all of it just works. The thing is it's very difficult to actually make a non-functional unit. In fact, this run right here uh, up to this point um, was uh, was more or less my attempt to uh, to beat this game with completely non-functional units using a combination of just bow guns and uh, short swords up to this point until I started realizing, you know what? After a certain point, there's just a minimum damage that people will do. You have to try really hard <laughs> to actually uh, completely screw yourself in this game. Um, because everything rubber bands more or less to where it's supposed to be. Now you might say, wait a minute, that's that's going to be detrimental to my, my RPG mechanics. I need my numbers. And yes, but no. Because everything is more or less relative, like I said. So if you work on somebody towards a particular thing, they will be comparatively better at that particular thing, but it does a really good job of making sure you don't screw yourself. <laughs> um, which, uh, yeah, the, the rest of the series has, certainly has had those moments. Um, hell, one of my favorite things is going back to, uh, like, convincing people to go back and try their uh, their old save files for uh, Tactics Ogre PSP, and just recommending one or two changes and realizing, like, oh crap, that's what softlocked me back in the day. <laughs> Anyway, so let's get, let's get into this game. So the, the overall mechanics here are relatively simple. Every character, as you see over on the top left there, uh, you've got four items uh, that each person can carry, as well as uh, four slots uh, for spells and abilities. Um, now, to uh, start off right away, unlike the uh, classic Tactics Ogre formula, these, are, these items are not just modifiers, they do actually function like equipment, just like Tactics Ogre PSP. So, if we look at this right here, we see that they have a power score, and then they also have a, uh, a stat bonus associated with each one. For your items, uh, for your defensive items, you have a physical defense and a physical resistance. So basically, hard armor and soft armor is the best way to think about it. Uh, the better your, uh, your overall main defensive score, the tankier they'll be, um, which basically means that people are not going to be scaling up their damage to crazy numbers. If somebody is running a bunch of soft armor, uh, generally speaking, the uh, maximum damage against them will be higher, whereas the heavier armor you equip, they'll basically just take plink damage. Your people uh, will permanently die uh, if their health reaches zero, but no need to worry because your units are fairly bulky, all things considered. Uh, they can take quite a decent amount of punishment, and uh, you know what? This is good. This is good because every... Uh, Basically every turn, everyone's going to be swapping off uh, turns to try and uh, try and uh, kill the hell out of each other. Now this can be, I mean, in most cases, it's perfectly fine. Um, basically, what it comes down to is just have your people work as a team. They even specifically say this in the intro: have your people always work as a team, back each other up, and you really won't have many problems. It's not necessarily a difficult game, but it is very fun to play around with. Um, so, uh, let's uh, let's cover a few other things here. Uh, there's hidden stuff all over the place and hidden mechanics all over the place because we actually haven't covered the most fun mechanic of this game, which is the emblem system. So basically, if you hit uh, either of the sides here in the uh, stat menu, you'll see this right here. This is their badge case, uh, full of all of the emblems that they have achieved up to that point. 
Um, different characters may potentially uh, not have certain emblems available to them, but these are all more or less like perks and modifiers uh, that everybody can run into. So for example, you'll notice all of this team, because they were running crossbows, has Sniper. Um, this means that they've hit three ranged attacks in a row, and it increases their agility, so comparatively they are going to be faster than everybody else. There's only three stats in this game. So strength is the overall burliness of your glutes, uh, intelligence does all your brain stuff and your resistance stuff, and then agility is your speed compared to everybody else. It also is one of the things that determines your movement range. So I mentioned earlier that uh, essentially your, uh, uh, well, your teams take turns. Traditionally in this series, the more items you equip, the slower your next turn comes. In this one, uh, the more items you uh, equip, the uh, well, the less distance that you can move. And I love that they actually um, that they actually give you a little breakdown over there of how far you can move. So, for example, glass pumpkins are an item that you can just find laying around, and they're very heavy. They're very good in increasing your armor, uh, but they also massively decrease your movement. So you're usually sacrificing one or you know about a tile of movement every time that you equip one of these. But anyway, it just kind of gives everything a little bit more personality that you can sort of feel the weight behind everything. Um, for the sake of context, pretty much all uh, all pieces of gear are more or less going to be worth it. There really isn't much that's uh, that's worthless. Like everything has a purpose. And, and again, if something has a purpose, nine times out of ten, it will tell you what that purpose is. Um, so, for example, if we were to go right here, uh, we can take a look at some of the weird builds from my original save file from when I was a kid. Um, which, uh, yeah, if you notice that this weapon has a weird name, just so you know, you absolutely can do things as crazy as transforming one of your units into a weapon and uh, then having it carry their unique uh, characteristics. Now, I accidentally did this as a kid and then didn't realize until way after the fact, so I just basically transformed one of my main units into a weapon. <laughs> I was just like, what does this cool item do? And I thought it was like a spell or something, and it's like, well... I mean, I guess a bag happened. Uh, hey, here's this fancy sword. I wonder how I get this character back. You can't. Anyway, um, point being, let's uh, let's go over this right here. So, w how do you actually build your people? However the hell you want. You know what? You have a unit that you want to be tanky, you give them a lot of uh, tanky-looking equipment. You uh, want to... Uh, you know, you, have, you want a unit to be a little bit faster, go a little bit lighter with them. Um, but... Point being, there is no restriction on anybody equipping anything except for monster units, which can only equip accessories. Um, which means that you can do funny things like this, like this uh, wizard that's carrying around a fan and a piece of chocolate as a shield. Now, is this a little bit strange? Sure. But if you equip somebody with a full set of chocolate, um, basically it'll, uh, it'll allow them to regenerate health as they eat their armor. <laughs> I mean... It, this game is just full of all kinds of little silly stuff like that, so you don't have to worry too much about the min-maxing and stuff like that. Like, if we take a look at the emblems, a lot of it is just like, it's for the purpose of world building, it's for the purpose of making your people feel unique, for giving them interesting modifiers and things like that, and also it's how you unlock classes. So, for example, if you wanted somebody to become a knight, they would train as a soldier, uh, which is everyone's starting class. And uh, it says that it's a certificate awarded for people who attack head-on, which basically means that, yeah, they're going to be eating counterattacks. If you attack from the front or sides, you get countered. If you attack from the back, the attack is safe, um, and you sometimes do a little bit more damage. But there's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but anyway. Point being that, uh, you know, they need to eat counters to become a knight. But at the same time, if they're sitting there dodging things left and right, then they become sword. Then they can theoretically become swordmaster later if they gain the stats to do so. Somebody can also become an angel knight, uh, which uh, basically means that they've been revived before, but then suddenly they got killed again, but had the stats and alignment to become an angel. Now, in this case, this is a post-game file, so this is just kind of like a little extra that you get. Your main character can't normally become one. Um, or, for example, you get ones like this, where if you only win a fight with three characters, you get get Mark of the Elite, or Centurion, if you have one character kill off everybody on the entire map. Or this one, which terrifies units uh, within uh, a few tiles of the, uh, of the owner, because they've gotten uh, 25 kills personally. See, one of those little touches I love about this series is that the mechanics of each one is basically tailored to the region where they're taking place. Now, Ovis here 
is, a, is basically a far more sparsely populated island than many of the other places in the series. It's actually a fairly large island comparatively, uh, if you ever look at any of the like maps of the series. But they value personal accomplishments a lot more than, you know, particular factions. So, for example, in Valeria, where Let Us Cling Together takes place, the factions are generally a far more of a factor, which means when they have the Terranites scaring people, it's because that was a unit used functionally for genocides in that region. Um, when you see that same unit show up in March of the Black Queen or Personal Lordly Caliber, people aren't scared of them. It's just another unit over there. In this one, if someone hears that, like, oh, this dude has gone on total warpath by themselves, yeah, that's going to be scaring them a little bit. Um, anyway, just one of those little touches that I love. I mean, all of these have something cool to them. Uh, actually, there should be one on one of these fairies over here. Like, they're not all good, just so you know. Like this one right here, Don Quixote. A warning for those who rush into battle hastily, suffering a brutal counterattack. Are they playing a few cards short of a full deck? Which, by the way, I love the translation in this. You can tell that they did did a good job with localization. Um, but basically, this is what happens when you take 90% of your health bar in a single uh, counterattack. And uh, it like you basically get hit so hard that you can no longer do crits. <laughs> Just criticals are not a thing for that character anymore. There are other emblems that'll counteract that. Um, like, for example, there's one called Miracle that I'm sure somebody must have, uh, wherein if somebody survives uh, with 5% of their health, or in some cases there's some other ones, like uh, I think for winning a multiplayer fight, which is a tad unrealistic these days, but technically possible, um, you know, that'll counteract it. But just point being, these little emblems end up making these characters... So it just feels fantastic, you know? It just feels so, so good. Um, and again, everyone's classes are just kind of determined by the stuff they've done and the stats that they've gained along the way, all that kind of thing. Um, so even if, you know, your stats are not min-maxed, it, it definitely gives everybody more of a personality along the way. So for example, this one. Uh, has died, has been uh, turned into a ghost, and then brought back with reincarnation. Um, a combination that takes, well, a completely unnecessary amount of effort uh, overall to uh, to potentially accomplish, but I just kind of wanted to have somebody with that particular uh, thing on them. But there's all kinds of, like, little mini effects like that, you know, transmogrifying people into different stuff, all kinds of different spell effects. By the way, this right here, this is a very 90s kid situation right here. Don't worry, I eventually got it right. <laughs> But kids from that time will know the struggle of you only had your family PC down in the den and you could only access the internet for like 30 minutes every couple days and it took forever to, to uh, go to uh, tacticsogre.com and then you couldn't remember how Deneb was spelled and you weren't about to sneak down there at 1am. So, <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, there's, I mean, I mean, you got hidden characters, you know, around, around here and everything else, but, um, but okay. So, you, you get the general idea. You equip items, they do exactly what you would assume they would do. Uh, if a character is specialized in something, they'll get a special animation, um, which uh, which basically just means that you know they're a little bit more accurate, they'll do a little bit more damage. You don't have to have somebody specializing in that thing, but it's just a cool little animation that they'll do. Uh, for example, we'll go ahead and load up a different save file, because my favorite animation ever is on, uh, is on one of these dudes here. Um... <laughs> But yeah, you, I, I want to absolutely stress, you don't have to min-max in this game. You don't have to optimize. You don't have to do any of that nonsense. Um, basically, what you want to do is, uh, well, just make characters as you, uh, as you go along, as you, feel, uh, as you feel fit to do so. Um, basically, roleplay. That's what, that's what I'm kind of getting at here. Um, all of these characters, depending on... Um, it's kind of depending on what you do. Obviously, we'll land in all kinds of different places, but you can't exactly go wrong is the thing. You will... Here, let me go ahead and set these both to computer real quick so I can keep yammering on here. You can't really go wrong. Everybody rubber bands more or less to where they have to be. So, for example, like that super weapon I showed you earlier from transforming a person into a weapon there. If you give that to, like, one of your sword masters or something... They're specialized in swords. They're a class that's specialized in physical attacks and everything else. Meaning that if you give them that weapon, like, towards the end game, let's say they're doing, like, 300 damage with a thing. 
you give the same weapon to a completely maxed out fairy unit. Like, they've learned... They've gotten their strength completely maxed out, they're as good as they can be, and they're still gonna do a hundred, because they're taking massive penalties on the fact that they're a character that's not supposed to be doing that stuff. Um, also, I just remember this guy had... Yeah. This guy has one of the fancy finisher moves. We probably should be not doing this fight this way. <laughs> Actually, you know what? This is fine. This will be funny. This will be funny. Let's just let them do what they're going to do. Um, by the way, at any point, you can put all your people uh, into a uh, into a training fight here. I, I love that swinging animation so much. It's a little, like, flippy slap with the sword. <sighs> so... Yeah, there's not really too much else to explain here. Um, if you ever need a little bit more damage, uh, tile damage matters so much more in this one than the whole rest of the series, so uh, definitely put those on there. Um, so, for example, you can get up to 15 extra damage just putting somebody on a matching element tile. Uh, opposing elements will do more damage to each other. Um, there's, you, Again, you don't really need to optimize that stuff. It's just something you can technically do. Um, as far as uh, alignments and things go, uh, your uh, your lawful units are usually going to be the good boy classes that end up, uh, well, that potentially... Ooh, I forgot that petrification instantly wins you a fight, because you can't unpetrify. <laughs> well played by the warlock there, well played by the warlock. It, this was another thing that was just really fun to do back in the day, by the way, uh, wherein you would you would just basically have your units fight each other just to see who's uh, winning that day. Uh, if you're wondering why everybody's got a giant skittle on them, this is basically an endgame super item that you more or less are never going to find normally. <laughs> I wanted to... Uh, I, I'd heard of the uh, the four-man challenge uh, for this for uh, like Final Fantasy or something like that, I think, at the time. Um and basically just wanted to do a four-person uh, run for this game. Or actually, no, 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 I think it was, um, I think somebody was doing, like, a five-man challenge of uh, Let Us Cling Together, and I was thinking, let's do it one better, and uh, and ended up doing a, uh, a four-person uh, challenge of Night of the Lotus, which, again, it's not really difficult, it's just interesting to pull off. Like, this is one of those games where, again, you're really never completely outclassed or anything. There's enough toys to play around with that you can make almost anything work. Like right here, you might notice this dude. Uh, he is a completely unarmed build. He fights entirely with his fists. Um, for example, realistically, I could probably have him take on the entire team. Let's uh, let's see if that happens. Let's see if, uh, if the AI can manage to solo a fight here against their leader. Possibly, I don't know. Uh, maybe he's got enough emblems to do so. So, as far as I can tell, the emblems are not affected by the whole rubber banding thing. So, again, everybody will always go towards, like, what they need to, uh, uh what they need to, uh, potentially be. You know, for better or worse. Uh, generally speaking, uh, this means that, uh, that yeah, uh, sometimes a physical attacker may have completely lower stats than somebody else, but due to the fact that they're in the correct role, uh, they'll end up potentially functioning better in said role than somebody with higher stats would. Um, again, this kind of goes completely contrary to how uh, Luct did it, uh, but this does feel very good. It all feels very tangible. Um, like, when you're actually going through the game and everything else, and I'm just like everything about it feels thought out. It feels like it's there for a reason. Um, like, um, pretty much all of the uh, the story decisions and whatever else, it's, it's something that you can go back to repeatedly, and it's just like every playthrough just will feel like like you're there. Like it, One example that I like to throw out there is a, is a giant fight that you have against the mermaids uh, partway through. And you'll notice after several playthroughs of like, it's not really a super difficult fight, but the first time you're going through that thing is super memorable. Like every time that I think of this game, I always think like the, the Ron Sea mermaid fight. And every time I'm always hearing that music in my in my head of just like the, the little like ethereal beeps and boops off in the background which the music it may not get you at first don't go fast forward and uh, you know turn all the music off and all the usual things people recommend I know I know that gets thrown out there every now and then just give it a chance because there's a reason behind the design of all of this stuff yes it does technically perform a little bit slow but that's mostly just a. You can appreciate the uh, uh, the animations there, 
and B, it allows you to kind of think everything through, more or less. Again, it doesn't seem like it, but it gives it more of an air of gravitas to it, I feel. Um, actually, what it always makes me think of nowadays, uh, there was an interview with, uh, uh, with uh, what's his face, uh, uh, Jake Solomon, I think uh, was his name, the, uh, the X new XCOM guy, um, in which they were interviewing, interviewing uh, him after they introduced what was known as Zip Mode, uh, where they sped up all the animations of the game. He was like, man, nobody's going to appreciate all these animations that we took all the time to, uh, you know, to go and set up <laughs> over several months. You know, like all these little things to give it more of a cinematic feel. Um, and basically, uh, it's kind of a similar thing here where there's little details to a lot of the animation that I know I personally absolutely love. Like you can see all of these special animations people are doing depending on their class. Um, every, uh, every move has its own animation. Um, depending on a lot of different contexts there's a lot of different animation changes like for example uh, one of the fun mechanics is that you can shield bash uh, units with a guaranteed chance to uh, knock them backwards if you knock somebody off of a roof your unit will pick up the shield and bash them over the head straight off the wall um so there's a lot of those little like, kind of like little details all over the place um so anyway uh, hopefully that's at least somewhat helpful here. Now, do you need to know the lore of the game getting into this? Do you need to know the story? Does it connect with anything? Technically, it does connect with everything. In fact, the canonical ending to this game is one of the worst endings you can get. Um, which is a little bit depressing because one of the best and happiest endings of the series comes from this one. <laughs> and, uh, people can say whatever. I think ending B should have just been the best ending. I mean, it is the best ending. There's no question. Uh, but... All of this is just, like, this entire game is just kind of built up to kind of hype up the tragedy of the entire series. Like, how much of everything was completely avoidable over a couple small decisions. And that's the Ogre series in a nutshell. Um, from the very start, the entire thing has essentially been a choose-your-own-adventure depressing chess simulator, where pretty much the best of intentions constantly go awry, and it's, it's very subtle is the thing like everyone's trying their best they're doing what they think is best at any given time and that doesn't necessarily mean it'll it'll end particularly well uh, well for them i mean again one of the nicest characters in the series well let's just say this game does not uh does, does not end up treating them particularly well <laughs> towards the end they were so close to a very very happy ending and uh yeah yeah, that's not the one that ended up happening in the long run. But anyway, so let's go back to classes real quick. All of them have their own little flavor, and I feel throughout the series, this is really the one that ended up flushing them out the best. Like, they have the most personality to them. Everything about this game is just, like, per oozing personality left, right, and center. Um, also, yeah, that guy just one-punched a unit. <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> which, by the way, there you go. That's how you uh, earn emblems. Apparently he's never, uh, he's never one-tapped a unit before, so now he just did. Uh, you can't earn all of them in training mode. Um, usually it's, uh, you can only earn emblems if they're within five levels of you. And also some of them just plain can't be earned in this mode. But, uh, any dang ways. Um, so yeah, all the units have their own personality. Like, for example, you've got something like the Valkyrie, which ends up, uh, boosting the morale of nearby male units. Um, which, it doesn't mention this. But you may have noticed earlier that, there, that there's a little meter. Uh, here, let, let me uh, show you real quick here, if I can remember where the pause button is. Also, by the way, hopefully that uh, random noise in the background isn't coming up. Let me see that pause menu, please. I think I'm going to have to wait till the next turn. But yeah, this is just a, to kind of show you that if built right, which, by the way, again, builds, not complicated... You just train people as a particular uh, type of, uh, like, <laughs> this right here is the difference that morale makes, so just to show you. Because this is a guy that has several emblems, like right here, Blood Rain. So basically, he's the one that's uh, terrifying everybody around him. I've got rel uh, Relixes. Uh, this is a guy who has actually already beaten the game, but uh, he, uh, he, can't, uh, he can't be terrified by anything. Um, this is basically a post-game emblem. Uh, other characters get it other ways. Um, uh, right here, War God, so, uh, he's, uh, got increased strength, but his intelligence went down, uh, that's more or less, uh, what happened a moment ago. 
We got Berserk, uh, which uh, it says affects changes in luck. It, it, there's this whole background mechanic called Biorhythm, um, which, by the way, uh, this actually applies to Arbitration here, uh, which is everybody has a chance to recruit other units. Anybody can recruit anybody else, but the base chance is really low. How this is all relevant to Biorhythm is it's this whole, like, background for lack of a better term, vibes mechanic. Everybody's got, like, their good days, their bad days, and they're just constantly on this wavelength going up and down as far as how their luck's going up and down every single day, just working in different ways. And the funny part is, depending on people's alignment, depending on their class, depending on the alignment of their class, depending on this biorhythm system, depending on the tiles they're standing on, the weather that day, there's so many things that go into whether or not something will be a successful negotiation uh, for somebody to join your team or not. It's it's kind of funny, and it's especially funny in cases like this, where one of the classes requires this one, called Vixen's Whisper. Awarded for using feminine persuasions to, to befriend enemies. Required to become a witch. Now, this is normally a eh, fairly... It's not a very powerful class. Uh, it, it, like, Deneb here is a secret unit. Uh, which I'll I'll put a link in the description. Um, but basically, there's a there's a bunch of little secrets just kind of scattered all throughout this game. Like for example, at the very start of the game, uh, if you go to Scabellum, that's that first port town that you start in, and then you go to one of the tiles nearby the boxes on the right side of the map, you'll notice that there's one tile that you can only reach nearby the water. If you hire a fairy or you started with a ninja, which uh, you'd think we would have started with those questions at the start, we didn't. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, one of the team comps that you can start off with is uh, is one that starts off with a ninja. Uh, anyway, um, you go to that tile, you pick up one of the best shields in the game right away. It's pretty neat. Anyway, um, so the reason that I'm uh, uh, that I'm mentioning all this is because there's little hidden stuff all over the place. Technically, you can find a bunch of really end game stuff really early. Uh, there's nothing stopping that from happening. Um, but, uh, but, 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 uh, you're in a situation where, yeah, all of it's affected by this biorhythm system. So if your character's just not in a good mood that day, or just stuff's not going well for them, they, you know, might go up to this, uh, secret hidden item tile, and they'll end up finding, let's say, just a healing item in there. Other times they might go there, and it's like, oh, here, I found this elemental nuke just sitting here. That, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> So yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, little little stuff like that. Going back to the to the classes for a second here, man, the warlock is just the coolest in this game. So the warlock has throughout the series just been kind of all over the place. Like in the um, in the ogre battle games, they're an AOE uh, caster, usually with like weird uh, backgrounds. Um, with uh, with the other tactics ogre, they they started off as a guy that specializes in weird forbidden magic and stuff like that. Oh, there we go. That guy just started as Don Quixote. Um, in uh, in the new tactics ogre, they were supposed to be the whole like part fighter, part scholar thing that they were going for, but that ended up uh, going um, a little bit sideways on, based on the fact that they only got access to daggers. Whereas in this one, they're like a, like a sword specialist, like a fencer sort with a bunch of uh, support abilities, a unique ability to buff their uh, their weapon with the opposing unit's element, or uh, against the uh, the other unit's element. So for example, this main character over here is uh, water, I believe. So he went and he uh, hit the guy with a fire sword. I mean, he missed, but he tried. Um, and, uh, you know, they're just a fun, like, trickster kind of class, and it's really, really cool, and you really feel that. Whereas, for example, with the Dragoon, that's this uh, gold-armored uh, guy over here. Um, they're, they're basically the elite knights of this universe, um, so usually they're an endgame class, and they've got special animations if they know that they're going to kill off a unit. So, for example, normally they'll take the knight's swinging animation uh, when it comes to swinging the sword, um, or they'll take the Valkyrie's uh, spear uh, animation uh, when they're swinging a spear. But uh, if they're about to finish a unit off, for example, they'll throw their sword in the air, catch it, and slap it on somebody's face. Or with the spear, they'll do a couple extra spins. So, it, you know, they just do a little, uh, a bunch of little extra flourishes because they're just showboating. They're the best and they know it. Um, so this thing just oozes personality. I mean, I know this is a guide that has functionally turned into a gush over how cool this game is, but honestly, if you have not tried it, just give it a shot. And you might have noticed as we've been going through, yes, even the AI 
is specifically designed to make mistakes every now and then, including how they're using that golem ability. <sighs> so, all right, I suppose we should finally cover those questions at the very start, right? Well, I'll tell you what. Um, from the beginning, as always, I recommend answering those questions either honestly or randomly. Answer how you honestly feel that day, or just however. Uh, they will determine your starting element, your starting stats, your starting party, and uh, a few extra uh, pieces of your loadout at the very beginning. For example, you might start off with extra healing items, uh, like a rapier, a, uh, I believe you can start with an S-Dog, I'm not sure off the top of my head right now, um, a longsword, like, it's all stuff that you can get from the stores pretty early. But either way, you know, you can skew your character towards a particular direction. Your overall damage might change by like 10 or so. Um, overall, you might notice that damage for the most part stays under 100 even in the end game. Uh, your health does not really go crazy high. And, uh, and yeah, generally it's all fairly kind of low power is, is the best way to put it. And I, I love it this way. You might notice also I constantly put bows on uh, on casters in this game. There's no particular reason to do this. I just find it funny. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. Just the idea of like I came to be a wizard. I'm just gonna cast arrows. <laughs> um, I want to say it all started with uh, watching uh, one of the, uh, the like strong bad comics back in the day of just somebody yelling arrowed. Anyway. Um, so, what else is there to cover? Oh yeah, so with those questions, though, there is one exception. Um, now, again, you can look at that guide uh, that I'll post a link to if you want exact ideas on what exact loadout you want to get. As I like to say, you can either play with a shuffled deck or a, you know, a set setup. It's entirely up to you. But, there's one question in particular uh, in which they ask, do you want belief, longevity, uh, or, uh, let's see, wealth, or what the hell is the other one? Mm, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, let's let's go over it. So longevity gives you fist fight. Uh, belief gives you miracle. Um, uh, oh, uh, wealth uh, gives you embodiment of desires. And then the last one. How am I completely blanking on that last one? Because this is, this comes up constantly. Well, anyway, I'm gonna feel dumb for that later. But moving on, that's the one that determines what emblem you start with. I'm just gonna tell you right off the bat. If you're looking for the most value for your choice. Belief gives you Miracle. Miracle is one that you need to survive a, uh, what would basically be a, a fatal hit at about 5% health. This is usually something that you clearly want to avoid doing, uh, because if your main character dies, you're, you're in a game over state. Um, now, the other ones you can get relatively easily. Arbitration you just get from hiring a unit, uh, wealth you just get from finding items on the ground, um, and, um, and yeah, the, the fourth one I can't remember for reasons that I also cannot remember. Okay, so that'll be that. Hopefully, I've at least convinced you to give this game a try. And uh, yeah, if you're if you're one of those folks that played this back in the day and you're wondering how to get a digital version, unfortunately, due to the fact that half of, not even half, I guess it's more like a third at this point, of the games of the series uh, were published by Atlas and appear to permanently be stuck in some legal limbo that we know absolutely nothing about. Um, Realistically, we probably won't ever see a digital release. However, and looking up how a DS could be used to transfer a GBA cart and saves uh, into, let's say, something called an R4 chip, if I were to throw two, uh, you know, similar sounding letters and numbers together at the same time randomly, um, then that could help you transfer your original saves over to something newer so that you could keep your childhood alive. You know, would be real good if my uh, FFTA uh, cart from back in the day hadn't been run over by a car. That would be real cool to have right now, but oh well. That'll be that. I hope this was helpful, or at the very least entertaining. Um, definitely give this one a go. It is a fantastic game. And again, what I said earlier about the, the fast-forwarding thing, yeah, it does run kind of slow, but just chill out and enjoy it. You know, it, not every game has to be fast. This is a very chill experience. Um, you only have up to eight units in your party. It's all right. It's all right. Don't worry. You'll make it. I think you'll be fine. Um, okay. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you all.